Hello, and welcome to Hear and Be Heard, 10 Community Conversations co-presented by Friends of the Library, Red Deer Public Library, and the Red Deer Puppetry Collective. With continu continually changing COVID-19 regulations, we have made the decision to proceed in a unique way with all our rehearsals and this intro performance done through Zoom. It's a bit more remote than even our live in-person Zoom performances as we had in November, but we are safe and we are doing our part to bend the curve. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy. The Red Deer Puppetry Collective recognizes that this land on which we live is the meeting place of Treaty 7 and Treaty 6 regions. We're representing the Blackfoot, Sutina, Pikani, Kainai, Stony Nakoda peoples. And it is also the traditional territory of the Metis people, Nehewak Cree, Salto peoples as well. We strive in the spirit of the treaties to keep this a place of trust, friendship, and promise. We acknowledge that promise and wish, and we welcome you to this place to share in respect for our future together and to move forward in a good way. Winter parties now and then Over hill and over glen In Tiremi, ancient Inca Saturnalia, Roman Not forgetting Nordic Yuletide Take us for a frosty ride Oh, oh uh, that was fast, Charlie Cheese yeah, this late in the season, Yule Logs or Us was almost out, and this was the only one we could afford, so... Those Nordic good luck piglets and calves coming from the sparks of the Yule Log just look wrong. No offense. Next year, you do it then. Sheesh! That's what you get for leaving it so late. Hey! The important thing is that you tried, Charlie. No, the important thing is what you're doing over there, Chucky. Mm -hmm. Present wrapping stuff mm -hmm. strewn all over. Furtive hiding of things when I walk mm -hmm. into the room. <gasps> Seems like a bit of the old annual C C seasonal present wrapping two-step to me. You are such a spoil sport. But I am indeed wrapping your Saturnalia Inti Raimi Yuletide present. Sharp-eyed as usual. Like oak cask aged English cheddar, that's me. More like straw baled moldering Belgian lum Limburger, <gasps> just as odorous. Um, were you down at the Caritas Haven for the homeless? Yes, and the smell, thanks for pointing it out, is just my own ode to Charlie, okay? I am a wheel of cheese after all. So lay off the smelly homeless people stuff. Sheesh. Uh, did you manage to get any chicha to celebrate Inti Raimi? No. They're all out at the liquor dump. Man, that fermented corn beer is all the rage since the ancient Inca solstice festival was stolen by the hipsters. And good luck finding a sacrificial llama. You should come down sometime. Uh, to the shelter? L lots of interesting people down there. Mm, not my style. I have enough people in my life, thank you very much. And I do plenty of charitable work, by the way. Oh, yeah? Like what? I... I... sign petitions. Online? And... and... I send money. Writing checks, signing petitions. Big deal. Try getting your hands dirty once in a while. I'm not a touchy-feely person, Charlie. You know that. Your loss, my poor dusty, wusty buddy wuddy. Uh-huh. There's this one woman, Joyce, a flight attendant, whose drinking got her grounded big time. Did you know that working in the airlines can be a real lonely life? Airport hotel to airport hotel, away from family and friends and lots of partying? Anyway, the booze got out of control. She was caught flying high. Boom. 
no more please fasten your sleep belts and return your tray table to its full upright and locked position boom into rehab boom out of rehab boom 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 still sharp as attack and with wicked sense of humor though too bad there were other options she didn't have to give in to the demon rum the demon rum where do you come up with this stuff chucky when life gives you lemons you put the zest into glass bottles add vodka ferment for a couple of weeks pour in boiled sugar water freeze and 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 limoncello <laughs> i was going to say lemonade and an alcoholic beverage is hardly appropriate given the story you just told yeah 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 but where's the kick in lemonade not very exotic just like you <laughs> careful boring unadventurous you have to play the hand you are dealt charlie life's a game and the ball is in your court did you wake up and drink a big glass of cliche juice or something let's pretend that the cards you were dealt featured an alcoholic mom empty fridge no lunch for school moving all the time because of being evicted compare that to a kid from a stable home food on the table clean sheets the latest toys you're telling me that just because maybe they go to the same school same teachers all that jazz that they are on the same level those are two very different scenarios mm -hmm. but many people have managed to pull themselves up by their bootstraps to escape their impoverished circumstances oh my gosh the old married toxicity waltz uh, do you mean meritocracy? The system by which people get ahead on their basis of talent, effort, and achievement rather than wealth or social class? Yeah, like I said, the meritoxicity waltz. Maybe what you don't know is that the people that pull themselves up and out of a bad situation, whatever, are in the minority. That it takes a lot of luck, not just pluck. Did you even know that poverty and its intergenerational effects are biological? Man, you got to get out more. In fact, get your mask. Pardon me? Get your mask. You're going to get your dusty butt and come down to the with me right now to the Caritas. See for yourself what it's going on out there. I certainly will not. Will too. Will not. Look, we can keep this up till the llamas come home, so I'll make you a deal instead. What kind of deal? You know how when you asked me what I wanted for my gift, and I said, I want the iPhone 32 with the time-space continuum adjuster and built-in can opener? Remember that? Yes, of course I remember. And if you think I'm going to buy you another tech gizmo that would be obsolete in a week, think again, my friend. Think again. Well, I've changed my mind. Now I want you to give my present away to charity and come with me down to the shelter. Let's go. And if I refuse? I'll smother you in gooey, cheesy hugs and kisses. Uh, 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 now, where did I put my mask? Uh, uh. <laughs> Two hours later. Oh, man, it's cold out there. How about some hot chocolate, Chucky Chalk? Ah, un bon idee. Coming right up with lots of marshmallows, just like you like it. Cheers! Oh, what was I thinking? A replica of the birthing stone of Mithra. Roman god of the sun? Cheese will probably think it's a doorstop. But it is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art online gallery shop, so the quality is supreme. And it comes with this fabulously crafted faux authentic Doric column. Woo! Winter parties now and then, over hill and over glen, into rainy ancient Inca, Saturnalia Roman. Heading Nordic Yuletide, take the floor Oh, here comes cheese. <laughs>
Ding dong. Uh, are we expecting anyone? Not that I know of. Well, don't trouble yourself. Even though I'm carrying a tray with mugs of very hot liquid on it, I'll answer it. Sheesh. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, look who I found lurking in our doorway, Chucky. Our plus one cohort member, Mr. Moderator. Hey, Chucky Chuck. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. M. Uh, but you don't have to knock. Just walk in. Yeah, take your mask off. Stay a while. Thanks, you two. So, I hope I'm not interrupting your hashtag Saturnalia slash Interami Yuletide Festival. So, okay, I couldn't find a sacrificial llama, so I thought I would do this. I'd bring you a little offering that's Ooh. seasonal. Chicha! Fantastic, Mr. M. Where'd you get it? I went all over town, the liquor dump. Hardly what you'd call all over town. And the swilling cupboard, don't forget. So how'd you manage, Mr. M? I have my secret fermented corn beer sources. You the walnut cheese bomb, man. What are, <laughs> what are friends for, eh? Boy, is that ever a crazy and radical Yule log. <laughs> Yule logs are us. Where else? <laughs> okay, my friends. Uh -huh. Here's to you. Ooh. Chucky, Ooh. thank you. Ooh. <laughs> and Chuck. <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And salute. Salute. Frost. Mm. 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 Nom, nom, nom. Oh, boy, that hits the spot, eh? The smoothest cream of corn chowder, but without the chunks. <laughs> so, what have you two been up to? I took Chucky to Caritas Haven for the homeless this afternoon. Cat got Chucky's tongue on the way home. Mm, a very thought-provoking excursion, Charlie Cheese. Upsetting and eye-opening. Uh, to realize that the difference between what we have and what they don't can sometimes be as simple as an accident or a few wrong turns. Incredible! I know, just listening to some of those stories is upsetting enough, but could you imagine living them? Uh, like that gentilhomme, uh, Richard, how would he have guessed that his being bullied by his father and then becoming a bully himself would lead to violence and then jail, then more violence, then some very bad tattoos? Boom, <laughs> boom, boom. Indeed. <laughs> I was glad Joyce was there so you could meet her. You know, the flight attendant I was talking to you about? Yeah, how's she doing? Inch by inch. Well, I'm glad to hear that something's happening, eh? Mm -hmm. Charlie Cheese, I want to thank you for dragging my dusty butt out the door and down to the shelter. And here I was all the time thinking that you'd never learn. Happy hashtag Saturnalia slash Yuletide. <laughs> this month's Hear and Be Heard conversation, co-hosted by the Red Deer Public Library and the Red Deer Puppetry Collective, Ooh! yay, is called Sweet Charity. Is it enough to write checks like our armchair activist Chuck? Or do you need to get active and roll up your sleeves like cheese and get out there and make a difference? Did you know, for example, that studies have shown that the more money you have, the less generous you are and the less empathetic. And the less money you have, conversely, the more generous you are and the more empathetic. And that people find themselves needing this kind of help. So there's lots for us to think about today. But before we get going, I'm going to call on my friends, Charlie and Chucky, to come and give us a hand because we want to point out some four areas in which we can have a very constructive conversation. So Chucky, uh -huh. Charlie, yes. before you get too wrapped up into Chicha land, please uh, come and give uh. me some help. What's up, Mr. M? 
I'd like the two of you to remind us of the four ways in which you can have a good kind of a conversation, which we're calling our something. I wrote this. Our elements of <laughs> something. <laughs> rules of engagement. Yes, thank you. Rules, of, rules engagement. of engagement. I get so excited about this. Rules yes. of engagement. Yes, the, the ideas we outlined last time. We were all together, Nepa. Exactement, mon ami. Okay, I'll go first this time. Number one, don't assume ill intention. Just because they have different ideas doesn't make them bad people or evil even. Number two, ask questions. Find out what the other person is thinking. Stay calm. Not easy, but very important. And finally, make the argument. In other words, let people know why you are thinking what you are thinking. It is not always obvious to everyone. Thanks, you two. And we'll see you next month, eh? And happy hashtag Saturnalia slash Inti Raimi Yuletide! A bien tot! <laughs> okay, see you soon. Right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, while Chucky and Cheese go and enjoy some seasonal cheer, I'm going to introduce our guests this week. And we're going to get started on tonight's conversation called Sweet charity. So here I am central. So when I was looking up the idea of charity and we were talking and discussing the plans for it, I began to look at the history of the word and the word charity comes from both ancient Greek and ancient Roman. And it was, it was gap and from the Roman, it was um, caritas, which means generous love. And then it moved into the French, le charité, and from the French into a Christian sense and the way in which we use it today, and now it's considered uh, charity. So um, it's from the original uh, generous love, and though it's not totally unrecognizable in today's world, it seems like it's light years away from this idea of generous love, I think. So um, just like everything else in the world, it seems like everything has become politicized. And so there may be generosity, but you know, is there still love? So joining me tonight are three very excited, passionate, brave Red Deerians who are jumping into the fray. And I'm going to start with Ranjit Mulakadi, and he is a great guy who comes to Canada from Kerala. And he came here on June 4th, 1998, and he's married and that, yeah, <laughs> he's married and has two children. And he is the king and the creator and the founder of the Central Alberta Film Festival. So, Ranjit, I'm going to ask you first and foremost, if you can talk for a few minutes about what your, let's say, personal relationship to charity is from your own personal perspective. So, my uh, personal relation, uh, relation with charity is, with charity is very community-oriented and uh, as goes to the right person and right value to give into those people. So be really involved. So for you, it's a reaching out into the community. Yes. Kind of like these community conversations that we're having, right? In a sense, beginning to have conversations around uh, those issues. Yeah. For community, uh, in my lifetime, I did a whole bunch of uh, like giving, giving is always always been my passion. I always give it to people who really need it. Number one, I last year I gave a couple of families a full grocery grocery for uh, for almost twelve months, and I paid the grocery store out in front and make sure they get a hundred dollar per month groceries for every month. Wow. Wow, that's incredible. That's really fantastic. You know, that's, that shows just kind of a, it sounds like for you, you really want a, a personal connection somehow. It's not, it's not, you know, arm's length, like, like Chucky Chalk sitting there writing checks. It sounds like, you know, even though you're donating money, you're also giving it a face and giving it kind of a real, 
you know, generous love, actually, going back to that original concept of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you. So, Stephanie Clemence, we'll go to you next. Yeah. So, um, Stephanie is an RDC student and she's pursuing her diploma in social work, working up towards a degree. Mm -hmm. She's very active in her church and she's on the worship team as a singer. So she knows all about um, that kind of a connection. And she's also um, working at Red Deer Public Library. So welcome, Stephanie. So maybe you can go ahead and, and um, give us an idea yourself Hmm. about some of your personal connections to charity. Right. Okay. Well, I'm like Ranjit. Um, you know, to me, it's not just about, you know, say giving money into an organization like a nonprofit or whichever. I like to have the experience myself, right? So when it comes to charity for me, it's more of like a how I live my life. If I know if somebody needs help with something, even if it's um, just an act of service, not necessarily even money, just being there for somebody um, is an act of love, right? And so when it comes to me forgiving, I like to be part of it, right? So if I know of somebody that, um, you know, has just moved to Red Deer, um, you know, they seem like maybe they, you know, don't have a lot of things, or maybe even it's not even necessarily that they don't have anything. I just want to be able to, you know, present to myself or present to them that, you know, they're heard or whatever, and that, you know, if they need anything, I'm there. Good. No, so, thanks. yeah. So this for me that that's that's a huge thing for me. I like to do stuff like that as well. So it's oh, an nice. experience for me too. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> you two so far are kind of putting me to shame. I'll explain that <laughs> in a little bit, but, but we'll get onto that. Not that this is a competition, I have to tell you. Yeah. So we're we're gonna welcome Leslie Crawford into our conversation now. Hey Leslie. Um, so Leslie has a doctorate in adult education at OISE and at the U of T where she wrote about the power of art and storytelling. So she's connected to the arts and she wants to find using those things, arts and storytelling to get to, let's say, know ourselves better and on a, a deeper level. So she's been a world traveler. She possesses a great amount of curiosity, loves the world and takes it all in and very introspective. And, and I think she would say that right now, one of her main goals is to strive to be someone who's kind and curious and really listens and connects. So, you know, perfect when we're talking about charity. So Leslie, over to you. Well, thank you, Matt, for quite an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna start by um, talking about who I write checks for. And so I have some favorite charities. I, I support the Salvation Army, the War Amps, the Central Humane Society, World Vision, whatever catastrophe is happening at the moment. But the charity that I really, really love is um, uh, Operation Smile that helps uh, children with cleft lips. And I was thinking about it because one summer, my mother rented a cabin at the lake in Sylvan Lake. And uh, we were about oh, maybe eight or nine and we met a young boy across the road that lived on a far in a farmhouse and his name was Percy and Percy had a cleft lip and we just fell in love with Percy. But you know, we knew that he had a disadvantage with this cleft lip because it opens you up for bullying, right? Because you look funny. Anyway, uh, we had heard later that Percy had able to, was able to get an operation. And um, so I just feel that if I give to that charity, uh, that can save a child from a lifetime of pain. Mm -hmm. So I love that one. Um, in terms of volunteerism, well, I've been in Red Deer now for about 12 years and I've, uh, I'm on the executive committee of the museum board. I've volunteered at the art center at the college. Uh, for the Festival of Trees. And right now, um, my main volunteer job is walking a four-year-old miniature schnauzer named <laughs> Annabelle. And I walk her four times a week, and it's a win-win because I love it, she loves it, and it helps my friend who is a hairdresser. She doesn't have to come home and, and see if she's doing okay. And the other thing that I've done is helped a, a new immigrant um, with her English and for helping her 
go through the credentialing process so she can become a teacher here. And what I want to say is that uh, if it hadn't been for my help, and um, I'm not being, you know, like uh, proud about this or anything, but it's just very difficult sometimes to navigate through the system. Mm -hmm. And so um, just remember that new immigrants sometimes need help getting through what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Now, I am a storyteller, so I am going <laughs> to tell a story because the volunteer job I want to talk about is one that I did when I was uh, studying at the U of T and I volunteered to work in a soup kitchen and I my job was not to make the sandwiches my job was to mingle with the homeless people that were there for lunch and I remember that very clearly I remember four individuals in particular um, there were two guys in their like late 30s and they um, had had normal jobs, one had been a postman, another had been a typesetter, but their addictions got the better of them. And they ended up like in the homeless shelter. And they were um, really shamed by that experience. But there were opportunities uh, to help them, you know, get back on track. But then there was this other, uh, a couple, and when I talked to them, I realized that their lives had never really been normal and that they were just going to continue on with the uh, alcoholism and living in a cock, uh, cockroach infested um, apartment as though that was normal. And um, so I think that sort of fit in with what uh, the puppets were talking about. And then I just want to bring into that is uh, last night I turned on my PVR and I saw a talk on 60 Minutes by the actress Viola Davis. And I just want to tell you what she said. She said at one time they lived in an apartment that was infested with rats. There were rats everywhere. And she said, I think there's a lot of shame involved with poverty, that you wouldn't be poor if you did the right thing. She said, when you're poor, what happens is that it seeps through your mind. It's not just a financial state. It's an invisibility state. It's a worthlessness state. And that's what I was thinking about when I, when I talked to the couple in, in that uh, soup kitchen. I just like to say, though, that, um, you know, generous loving can also mean just a smile, a kind word to somebody, um, not reacting, responding instead. And, you know, sometimes just think about asking somebody a question, just showing some interest or curiosity in somebody. And I will just finish by saying yesterday I had another birthday. I'm a year <laughs> older than I was yesterday. And uh, I was the recipient of uh, so much love and generosity from the friends that I surround myself with and friends that uh, don't live in Red Deer because I've lived in a lot of different places. And um, I can't tell you just how... Uh, heartwarming it was for me. So I think um, we have to do generous loving and generous receiving. And the last thing I will say, one of the best things you can do for yourself that I can do for myself is to love myself and, and treat myself with compassion. So thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be a tough act to follow, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That Taking it back, I, I think the three of you are really feeling um, this strong personal connection to giving and then to that basis of, of the love that comes from it, right? Mm -hmm. And we live in a world where there's so much going on and there are so many demands. And it's very easy to click online petitions and feel you're doing something or write checks and sign them and send them off. And we know all of that's necessary. We have to activate, we have to make some noise, we have to respond to the world we live in. Um, but you're taking it to a very personal level and I think that's terrific. Mm -hmm. So um, before we move on to some more questions, 
I've got a few little tidbits that I found online about charity today because I did quite a bit of reading and research for it. So if you don't mind, um, in medieval Europe, the poor were feasted at funerals so that they would pray for the deceased. So in other words, the wealthy class would have a funeral mm -hmm. and they'd have all the poor people of the community come and they would give them food in exchange for making sure those poor people prayed for the person who died. So <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of wacky on a certain level. Yeah. And, and apparently people of faith tend to uh, give more money than people who don't have a faith. And again, the wealthier you are. So this goes back to the idea that, that Chuck and that Charlie Cheese talked about tonight was that the wealthier you are and studies are showing it, showing this out, mm -hmm. the smaller amount you'll give and the, the smaller proportion of your fortune, if you will, versus someone who's very poor, they'll give a lot more relatively, almost double yeah. the amount. Um, so now I'm going to sort of read this because this is a bit longer. So now we're moving into an area that is a very interesting critique around charity. And people have been kind of sort of looking at it and criticizing it. And we'll get into a few things in a minute. So you'll indulge me again for a sec. So this comes from Wikipedia. And it's a philosophical critique of charity that can be found in Oscar Wilde's essay, the Soul of Man Under Socialism, and I started to read it today, it's an excellent essay, where he calls charity a ridiculously inadequate mode of partial restitution, usually accompanied by some impertinent attempt on the part of the sentimentalist to tyrannize over the poor's private lives, as well as a remedy that prolongs the disease of poverty rather than curing it. So he's saying we go and we throw cookies to people and alms, and we aren't doing anything to lift them up and make them equal and balance. And then there's a Slazov Zizek, who's a Slovenian thinker, and he adds this description of the effect of charity on the charitable. In 2010, he wrote this, and this, this really, for me, struck home. When confronted with the starving child, we are told, for the price of a couple of cappuccinos, you can save her life. The true message is, for the price of a couple of cappuccinos, you can continue to, you can continue in your ignorant and pleasurable life, not only not feeling any guilt, but even feeling good for having participated in the struggle against suffering. So as I've written in my notes here, yikes, there's a bit of a can of worms. So I'd like to pass it around to everybody. What are your thoughts about this idea in the sense that charity can be also looked upon as a way to keep people down and keep people um, in poverty, for example. So let's go to the last person first, Leslie. Do you want to respond to that? And then we'll go to Stephanie and then Ranjit. Well, you know, I just think about the fashion industry, right? Um, and we don't really know the faces behind that. Um, so I have to say that I think there's a lot of denial about how things really uh, operate in the world. And behind everything, there's a, there's a face, there's a story. Um, so we live here very comfortably in our capitalist society. But we know that, for example, in China, you know, where a lot of our things come from, there, um, the, and I lived in China, uh, which is an interesting story in itself, but the people leave the countryside and they leave the children behind with the grandparents. And they say there are tens of millions of children that were raised without their parents. In the meantime, those parents are in the factories making our Mac computers, right? So I don't know, you know, where there is justice. Some people might say, oh, well, those people wouldn't have a job if they just stayed in the countryside, right? Um, so anyway, that's how I would respond to your first question there. Right. Good. Okay. Yeah, it's true. You sort of get a sense of we live in such a consumerist society and we want all this stuff 
but also we're guided and pushed towards it. I'll talk about it a little bit later, but I watched a documentary today and I'll hold up the box later. I got it at the Red Deer Public Library, go figure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, it was very, very revealing and very moving. And even though it's not directly about charity, it moves into this whole kind of story and this sense of what we're talking about. So Stephanie, yeah, why don't you jump in? Well, so like my take on it is, um, you know, when you were speaking, I was thinking of situations where I myself have given to people that, you know, have had misinformed, like, you know, tragic things happen in their lives, right? So say like a homeless person, you know, I would, you know, say give them $5 or something and somebody would say to me, you know, you know, why are they, why are you giving them $5? Because they'll just go and use it for this or whatever, right? So it's like kind of having that mindset as well. And so, but I don't look at it like that, you know, and it's just like what they do with it is what they're going to do with it. But at the same time, it's like, you know, they may just go and get themselves some food. Right. So I'm not going to cast that judgment down upon them. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's how, what I took from that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Ranjit. I'm absolutely with Stephanie because mm -hmm. uh, for a few years back I was in, in south of India and went for a grocery store around 11 o'clock. So I saw a, a little boy and a mom standing there looking for a food. And the, the, what boy did, boy grab a, a sandwich from the store without asking them. And he accidentally dropped it because he was hesitated. He dropped it and the kids started crying. And I was keeping an eye on him. And the mom was very mad at him. So what I did, I went and grabbed a whole bunch of grocery for him and plus a sandwich for him and gave it to him. So instead of giving money, is sometimes you think, why would I give money instead of giving food? But also I was thinking, if I give money, it's giving from my heart. Like Stephanie said, I don't care what they do with it. My heart is satisfied because I gave them five bucks or I gave them food. So that's my take on it. Well, and I think what I'm hearing from the three of you is you're responding in a very personal way when Leslie was talking about the little boy with the cleft lip mm -hmm. and Stephanie's talking about that connection. And Ranjit, you talked yesterday when we were having our meeting about your own connection to hunger and the need for food from when you grew up and what you had. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, one of the personal connections I have as a gay man is looking at the way gay people are treated around the world and 64 countries would would either put us in jail or put us to death for who we are mm -hmm. and so you know some of my check writing some of my activism sort of goes into that corner um this isn't you know about the money and the not money kind of a thing but you know it's sort of that personal connection that i have to being out there and feeling something in that way you know um so I want to look at this really interesting debate that seems to be going on right now. And we didn't talk about this yesterday, so I'm throwing this at you folks. You get to think on your feet. <laughs> so this is the question and there's a debate between um, a needs-based or a rights-based sense of how we are in the world. I'm not going to use the word charity because it, that sort of comes in only on one side. So if you talk about the needs-based, so needs-based comes from philanthropy, from charity that we're talking about, and we get people's basic needs met. So there's food and clothing and shelter, but there's no participation on the part of the people who are getting this charity. And it comes from let's say individuals, philanthropists, it comes from charities, uh, as I said. But the big key takeaway is that these people are passive recipients of your largesse, okay? Now, the rights-based um, kind of side of this story is then, guess what? Everybody in the whole spectrum has a conversation, has a seat at the table, and has the right to talk about what their needs are and how they might be met. So in other words, let's say I'm a very poor person and somehow I'm invited to this conversation and then I get to say, well, wait a minute, 
maybe I need this. And how can we build a community that has that? So it becomes, from my perspective, a little more connected. And one of the things is that, I don't know if you know the billionaire Michael Bloomberg. So he, I don't know if he was the mayor of New York for a while, but anyway, I can't remember. I should have looked him up other than the fact he gave one point, I just got to look this up. He donated $1.8 billion to the John Hopkins University for all of the students to pay their student debt, Wow! right? So it sounds really fantastic, but there were two things or three things about that. One, that guy got a $600 million tax break. He was able to choose where he put the money and say, guess what? I'm putting it into my alma mater. And therefore, it increased his reputation, of course, because it's an astounding amount of money. It also increased his level of power. And the problem with it is that that $600 million tax break takes it away from the public coffers where the four of us could be saying as a community and as a citizenry, we have the right to help guide and shape where our world is and how we take care of each other. So for me, the question that, that comes from that is, I mean, I, I might have prejudiced because I sort of presented one kind of Rosalie and the other not so much, but um, it seems to me that we're, especially with COVID, I think we're moving down a certain path The sort of talking about the kinds of people who are, are really struggling and maybe societally and from an institutional standpoint, we have to change things. So let's um, see what you're thinking about that, you three, about the, the rights based versus the needs based. And just have some comments if, if it struck you as sort of wow or yay. And I'm also hearing a dinging all the time. I'm not sure what that is. Must be the ringing in your ears. Ha <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, I sort of sneak. That's oh. me. Is that you? Ranjit. <laughs> oh my gosh. He's so popular. Okay, put that thing away. I did already. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm sort of going, because I thought we might be getting, and of course, if anybody's watching, please feel free to jump in, give us a comment if there's a question, all that kind of stuff. So Ranjit, why don't we go to you again? So we'll talk about this um, rights-based versus needs-based and what, what thoughts came up. See, my thought came up uh, with, uh, see, some, some non-for-profit, they have a specific need. And some charity need a specific need. What, what I'm referring to is what that money you're spending is going to the right project. Giving to charity is not a big deal. Also giving to non-for-profit is not a big deal. But my, my full intention is to give with my heart and uh, see the project is run properly, not in a side base. There are, in these days we are living in, you don't know what the, where the money goes. We need to know where the money actually goes. Like right now we are struggling in the society in a lot of places, lots of non-for-profit, like mental health, sexual, sexual assault. There are lots of area which needed money so bad, now they can't. So I'm willing to give, which is, is community supported. So do you think that some of that though comes down to, again, the question of our society and saying, look, it shouldn't be up to the billionaires, for example, to say I'm choosing these three or four things and that's what's important when other people and the society at large thinks other things are important. So you've got that, I don't know, potential Im imbalance maybe. I mean, I know there's going to be a balance of it, but you know, um, I think for me anyway, the idea of the, of the, of the um, rights-based starts to feel more collective and more community oriented. So for example, you might be talking to the people who are victims of sexual assault and finding ways in which they need help as opposed to just you know, dumping that money in there. Of course, we all know that we need it, but we have a society that doesn't take care of each other. 
That's mm-hmm. part of the problem. Everybody's abandoning ship. So, Stephanie. Um, well, I just think, you know, like even within Red Deer, right? Like there's so many issues. And I feel that, you know, if people would come together as like a community and be aware of the issues that are here within our own town, you know, there's nothing wrong with, I think, you know, giving to, um, you know, different organizations around the world or whichever, because there's, there's so much everywhere all over the world, but why not look after our community and come together and start here, you know, and yeah, I just, I just feel that that could, that could be like major changes, right? Just even if we start here. Right. You know, that clear conversation and kind of yeah set it up from it from a needs based where you're right. meeting with the stakeholders mm-hmm. and not just saying here's a here's a here's 10 bucks kid yeah go and get your lip fixed mm-hmm. you know as opposed to saying look what do you need leslie well i'm just thinking of a number of different things uh just popped into my head uh, was noam chomsky it actually shares yeah my- yeah um and how he talks about how we are a spectator democracy um that we show out show up to vote but then we go back to the shopping malls after that's all over and i think that um as a as communities we have um kind of given up our our rights to the people you know in power and I think that uh, if we want to have our voices heard, uh, we have to do a lot of grassroots organizing. I mean, it's hard work to, um, to have a voice, I guess, in today's society. And mm-hmm. uh, I was well, also reminded it, of um, yeah, go ahead. the development community, you know, like CETA. Uh, they would go down to Africa and they would talk to, to the men. And then they finally realized, well, no, we better have these conversations with the women because they're the ones doing the farm work. Like they were talking to the wrong people. So um, a lot of it has to do with the, the, the patriarchy and, and the, the way things have been designed by the people in power. And so in some ways, uh, it's, it's okay for me for people like Bill Gates and his wife to go around and spend their money where they want to because um, they made it they, and, and they're doing good work. So I don't have a problem with that. It's just but that what, it is a lot of work to, we have to come back together and do the hard work to be able to hear our voices. But does that, for me, when you're talking about sort of Bill Gates and that kind of stuff, it goes back to me that central issue because they're finding ways to avoid paying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of taxes that they're siphoning off from um, the public coffers so that then the people near the bottom have to pay their lion's share of the taxes and the wealthy people can say, well, I can pick and choose and it's very fancy and, and, I'm, and I'm not saying that some of the work is not valuable but they're giving it that emphasis and they're getting those tax breaks and those tax havens. Cause I mean, $600 million that Michael Bloomberg got as a tax credit for donating 1.8 billion. And yes, again, we know the cause, that cause for those students, of course it helps them and you don't know how that's gonna feed them in the future, but yeah, well, I think anyway, have- Leslie, go back to you. I think what you have to think is, is, uh, you know, you've got all of these graduates now that aren't stressed, uh, having this humongous debt over their heads, because nowadays, it's actually a crime that so many um, people graduate from university and they have this big debt. So they therefore are free from that debt and they're freer to, I guess, do the good work that they're doing right with people so we we really don't know how that's gonna filter out to the masses right sure no that's a good point Um, and also bill and melinda gates are doing a lot of work uh with education in the united in the united states Mm -hmm. and i think that's a really very worthwhile cause Um, yeah i i don't i don't think that we're concerned in some ways with the causes because 
these are valuable causes. I think it's just the principle of it and the sort of sense, okay, um, how does how does this all work? Um, well, well I think anyway, so so STEM problem is being having a billionaires in the first place. That's yeah, yeah, no, of course, system, right? Yeah. Yeah, I agree 100 percent I don't know the the feed seems to be going a little bit off and on um so now we're talking about this still getting into a little bit of the meat what about this idea of guaranteed annual income which starts to move that that needle a little bit creating some more uh sense of equality or or distribution of wealth in a sense so I know we sort of talked about it yesterday I I brought it up Stephanie, you were going to look into it a bit. Do you want to sort of <laughs> give a rundown of what you think it is or what you, what you, you understand know, it to in be? All, in all honesty, I, I had full intentions on really looking into <laughs> it. Um, you know, I'm a mom and I'm in school, so I've been very busy. Um, but, you know, I did, I spoke to one of the girls at work the other day and I said, you know, what, what do you think about this, you know? And... <sighs> I mean, I think there's going to be pros and cons to something like that, right? Like, you know, when I, when I think about it, of course, I would love to have equality among people, you know, but I mean, I, I don't know really a lot about it. I would love to have equality, but really, is that going to be possible? I'm sure there's going to be, there's going to be cons to that if that was ever the case, right? So I, I don't know. Okay. Ranjit, thoughts about guaranteed annual income? I've done a bit of reading about it. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm a big My thoughts are on a, on a steady income is kind of a, if as a family getting a steady income, they can budget it. Mm -hmm. They budget right. under the year. It said, okay, I have this much. I did all the bill paid. I don't have a debt. So I have so much money I can give it to. So in that way, you can budget it, then get, uh, get to choose what charity that you want to give. Right. Oh, sure. If we're talking about from that perspective, but I'm saying that there's this basic, every man, woman, and child gets a certain amount of money every month. So sort of a, a living wage for being human and on the planet. And that's our contract to say we're taking care of everybody. Leslie. I'm all for it. And Yay. <laughs> I'm all for it. Yeah. You know, I, do, I have a question about it, though, you guys. So would that mean that's kind of what you get for your income and you have no opportunity to achieve more? Oh, no. Um, wait. I'll... Okay, wait a sec. Help! I seem to have lost somewhere. Am I gone? No, Can I see that. here. Can you yeah. see me? Yes. Well, I've got this stupid Zoom thing asking me to update something, and I don't know how to get rid of it. Yeah, it press on the update. What's that? Well, what does it tell you to update? It says update to 5.4.2 now. Oh, okay. oh, do you know what it is? I, I believe Zoom um, kind of taps out at an, is it an hour? Well, I think with the library though, they've got a license for the thing to oh, just keep okay. going. Yeah, I'm not too sure. Is there a is is there a way to just hit cancel? I don't know if that would kind of take us. Well, I don't out. I don't want to disappear because I yeah. might suddenly go away. So you know what? Maybe I guess I'm gonna either. I'm gonna stare at this stupid Zoom five point four point two. I can't even see your lovely your lovely faces. So um, <laughs> what I'm gonna what I'm gonna say a little bit about the guaranteed annual income is that right now in Canada. 80% of the people who live under the poverty line are working one, if not two jobs mm. to, to try to make ends meet. And, um, and um, so there is that kind of issue that, you know what, if they get this certain level of money, let's say it's $1,200 or $1,500 a month, and then they go out and get jobs and they're adding more to that and earning more money. Well, right now in the welfare kind of a system, that money that you get from welfare is clawed back when you earn some money. But with the guaranteed annual income, let's say it's $1,200 for you when you earn another $800 in a month, that money doesn't get clawed away. Anyway, hmm. it's, um, it's, it's, I think, the way the world's going to have to go because this crap that we're all dealing with right now and the fact that most of us are sitting on the bottom... Um, it just doesn't work. And even though we know that it's as, as um, Leslie was saying, it's been 
designed that way, to be honest. And for several hundred years, it's been in the, it's been in the kind of works to make sure that the wealthy stay with power and everybody else has no power. And that's been proven over and over again. Um, so now before I let you go, I'm going to, first of all, uh, show you this documentary that I keep talking about that I saw today. And oddly enough, Leslie, it's Noam Chomsky. And it's this one. Can everybody see it? Oh, lift it up a little bit. Up, up, yeah. Oh, up a little bit more. Up. Okay. No. Oh, I got to get that one. So it's called Requiem for the American Dream. And boy, was it ever an eye opener around this very kind of subject in the sense of inequality and disparity and who's got the power mm. and all that kind of stuff. So before I let you go, um, why don't we have each of you maybe give a final conversation? Why don't you say a little bit of something you discovered tonight that felt like a bit of an aha moment for you? Oh, and because I can't see anybody, uh, <laughs> let's go for you, Leslie. Gee, you kind of caught me there um, with an uh, aha moment. Well, it's interesting that you have my, my favorite there. Um, Noam Chomsky because I'm definitely going to get that documentary been following him for um, ever since I know oh, for the last 30 years anyway um, I think that um, the aha moment is um, let's just be good to one another mm. as much as we can yeah and that's I think we would probably all four of us would agree on that point I agree. Stephanie. Um, I just, I think this is amazing just coming together with, you know, people that, you know, it seems like we all have the same heart in giving and wanting to make a difference. And I just want to encourage people to, you know, not wait for other people to step up to do something. Um, you know, we can all personally, individually make a difference, right? And then that will be collectively. So the more we each step out to do something, you know, it, it just starts there. It starts with us. Right. That nice personal connection again. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it's very important. And I think right now, unfortunately with COVID, it, it's, it makes things a little bit more challenging. Um, Cause even to volunteer in places right now, it's, it's a huge challenge with me being an RDC. Um, I needed to have X amount of hours for volunteering and it's, it's challenging right now being able to even, you know, give of your time um with the covid but um yeah i think it's just nice to come together and speak about this stuff and just make an awareness nice good thanks stephanie yeah, Ranjit. see uh in red deer we have hundred thousand people living in a small city mm -hmm. but there are lots of talented people they are holding on to it and they won't let them go if you open it up for for the community, they probably achieve more than what they expected. So that's what uh, my concern in that year, like let it go and be with somebody and let, let the other people know you exist and uh, move forward and open up with the community. Nice, yeah, yeah, good. Okay, so I, I want to thank all of you, Ranjit Mulukadi and Stephanie Clemence and Leslie Crawford for jumping in on number two of our Hear and Be Heard 10 Community Conversations. Again, to remind you, it's co-hosted by the Red Deer Public Library and the Red Deer Puppetry Collective. And uh, it's going to be recorded and it'll appear in a few days on YouTube, I'm told. I want to wish everybody um, a happy hashtag Saturnalia slash interrami Yuletide. Or <laughs> if you insist, okay, happy Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or Christmas. And we'll see you back on January the 10th, same time, same station. And we're going to be doing a Central Alberta look at racism. So we're moving into, uh, in the next subject, kind of a pretty darn heavy subject. But on behalf of the Red Deer Public Library and the Red Deer Puppetry Collective, my name is Matt Gould and I want to thank you all for your time and attention. 
and I get to say goodnight to this Zoom. 5.4.2 is here. <laughs> Screen. <laughs> how crazy is that? <laughs> All right. So I, I think that's it. I'm not quite sure how Alyssa from the library is going to end it. But I thank you all for coming and wish you all the best of the season and stay healthy. My heaven, you know, with all this stuff going on, stay home. Yes. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Have a safe Christmas, everybody. Thank yeah, yeah. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.